Jesus did not say to the righteous ones, I was hungry, and you lobbied the government to do something about it. I was thirsty, and you shared an article on Facebook about my plight. I was naked, and you wrote an opinion piece about my suffering. My point is this. The kind of work that Jesus commands the righteous to do are personal, hands-on acts of love. Personal, hands-on acts of love. They involve one human being standing in the physical presence of another human being and treating them humanely. So, in her, her sermon last week, Jasmine said that if it were possible for us to make up an 11th commandment to add to the Big Ten, it would be this. Thou shalt not judge. I don't have to tell you that we're all really uncomfortable with, with judgment, myself included. For example, when as a priest I'm counseling someone, I go out of my way to be non-judgmental. I go out of my way to communicate you know, the feeling that I don't think less of a person because of past decisions that they've made that they now, you know, regret. And I'm sure you're the same way, right? In modern parlance, we don't want to stigmatize others. Here's the thing, though. Making judgment calls about other people's character, I think, is a necessary part of navigating your way through life. So when, for example, it comes to finding an appropriate babysitter for my kids, I don't think to myself, oh, anyone will do. No, I have to make judgment calls about people, right? And I think any loving parent would do that. Many of you are parents. When you needed to find a babysitter for your kid, what did you do? Well, I think what you might have done is gone through this mental list of people that are kind of living in your immediate vicinity, and the, you would have divided them then into two categories. Those whom you would trust with your kids and those whom you wouldn't trust with your kids. And if somebody, for example, is wanted for multiple felonies, I'm willing to bet that the category that you place them in wouldn't be babysitting material. You just wouldn't put them under that category in that column. So that's what judgment is about. I think judgment is ultimately about categorizing. And that precisely is what the New Testament word for judgment means. The New Testament uses the Greek word krino, and translated into English, krino literally means to separate or to divide or to put asunder. And this is where we get in today, into today's reading from the Gospel of Matthew. It's one, what's known as the parable of the, of the sheep and the goats. And in this parable, Jesus paints us a picture of the kind of ultimate judgment that awaits us at the end of the age. And at this time, Jesus, the Son of Man, the King of Kings, will finally take his throne and he will seat himself before all of humanity, those who have ever lived and those who have ever died. And at that time, at that time, he will judge, which is to say he will categorize, he will separate all of humanity into two groups. On the one hand, there are those that are declared blessed by God, and they're invited, of course, into everlasting life. On, on the other hand, there are those that are declared cursed and told by, by Christ the King to depart from his presence for all eternity. And what decides a person's eternal fate is simply this, how in life they responded to Jesus. And I'll say that again. What decides a person's eternal fate is how they responded to Jesus in their earthly lives, particularly in how they responded to Jesus as Jesus appeared to them in the least of these, his brothers and sisters. So that's really at the heart of today's reading from Matthew's Gospel. Now, the way we understand this passage of Scripture, I think, hinges around one really important question. Now, here's the question. Whom is Jesus referring to when he speaks of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, the least of these, my family members? And over the past 2,000 years, uh, gallons of ink have been spilled in an attempt to answer that particular question. But I'm going to save you a whole lot of reading by, by simply telling you this. When it comes to that particular question, who are the least of these, my brothers and sisters, there are two major schools of thought. 
The first school of thought says that Jesus is talking about his followers. He's talking about Christians, particularly Christians who are poor and desperate and needy. And I think there's a lot of scriptural evidence to support this particular reading. For example, um, there's this story where Jesus is standing in this crowd and he's delivering a, a sermon you know, to a large group of people. And all of a sudden he finds out that his mom and his brothers are looking for him. Someone maybe says to him, Jesus, you're... Your, your, your mom is here with, with, with your brothers and they want you. And upon hearing this, Jesus asks his audience this rhetorical question. He says, who is my mother anyway? And for that matter, who are my brothers? And then right in the middle of his sermon, he points to everybody in the crowd and maybe he gestures to Mary Magdalene and Peter and James and he says, look, these are my brothers. These are, this is my mother. Anyone who does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. So based on this theory, at the end of time, the rest of the world will be judged on the basis of how they treated us, that is, Christians, or perhaps more accurately and specifically, those among us who are poor and needy. So that's one school of thought. I think there are a lot of compelling arguments in its favor. And Jesus says, uh, even in, in, in Matthew 10, 42, if you give even a cup of cold water to one of the least of these, my followers, you will surely be rewarded. There's a second school of thought that, in my opinion, is actually a bit more compelling. When Jesus speaks of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, he's referring to everybody, perhaps Christian, perhaps not, who is in desperate need. Need of food, need of water, need of clothing, need of belonging, need of companionship. In short, in need of the basic necessities of life. And I'll tell you why I think Jesus shares a special kinship with people like this. I think it's precisely because these people are lowly. Name a multi-billion dollar investor that you know who goes around begging for food, right? I don't think Warren Buffett, for example, is found at, at, at you know, soup kitchens and food baskets, right? You just don't find multi-billionaires in places like this. I haven't heard of a major politician, a prime minister, or a president who doesn't have access to a clean source of drinking water. I've never heard of an A-list Hollywood celebrity who can't afford to buy a winter coat, for example, or a pair of shoes. No, if people find themselves in desperate need for the basic necessities of life, I'm willing to bet that they're on the lower rungs of the social hierarchy. And that's precisely where Jesus goes. This is what Paul writes. Though Christ Jesus was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. So in short, if you want to find Christ, don't climb up high. Instead, stoop down low. And the church has always taught this throughout the centuries. We may have not exactly lived up to that, but we've always taught it throughout the centuries. We are not to find Christ. We are not to find God. We are not to experience the divine in, in high places, in state capitals or great halls of power, at parties thrown by billionaire investors on their private islands and yachts. We are not to find Christ in high mystical states, painstakingly achieved through weeks of isolation, fasting, and meditation, or in high psychedelic states achieved through, through LSD or mescaline. Again, Christ is not found in high places, whether social high places or high places of the mind, high places of the psyche. Rather, Christ is to be found in slums and shanty towns and brothels, in soup kitchens and psych wards and low-income housing projects. Christ is found among the poor, among the poor in spirit, um, among the poor in substance. These are Jesus' brothers and sisters. Now here, I, I should say that they're not Jesus' brothers and sisters because they happen to possess a particular kind of moral purity or, or special holiness. I think there's a temptation sometimes to romanticize you know, the poor and, and ministering to the poor. On the contrary, the needy are... I think a lot like everybody else. Some of them might be saintly. Some of them might be sociopaths. No, these people are Jesus' kin 
precisely because it is among such people that Jesus has chosen to abide. That's where he's chosen to pitch his tent. Now, what does that mean for us? Well, it means, of course, that if we reject such people, if we walk past them day by day without lifting a finger to help, then we reject Christ. And if we reject Christ, as we learn in today's parable, Christ will reject us. He will say to us, depart from me. And I know that that sounds harsh, but that's particularly what Jesus says. That's exactly what Jesus has to say. And I really don't have the liberty to preach anything else other than that. So here's the question I do want to explore next. What kind of service did the righteous render to the needy that resulted in their vindication on the day of judgment? So in other words, what did the righteous do that Jesus deems praiseworthy? Now here, I find what Jesus does not have to say to be just as interesting as what he does have to say. And I'll put it this way. Jesus did not say to the righteous ones, I was hungry, and you lobbied the government to do something about it. I was thirsty, and you shared an article on Facebook about my plight. I was naked, and you wrote an opinion piece about my suffering. I was a stranger, and you tweeted out an editorial about me. I was sick, and you voted for the MP who promised she'd do something to help me out. I was in prison, and you preached a sermon encouraging people to take pity on me. Of course, I'm, I'm being kind of cheeky here, but I have a point. And my point is this. The kind of work that Jesus commands the righteous to do are personal, hands-on acts of love. Personal, hands-on acts of love. They involve one human being standing in the physical presence of another human being and treating them humanely. And, and don't get me wrong, advocacy and protest and voting and political action, I think, all have their place. They have their place even in the church. And, and when I think about that, I think of great prophets like Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And, and if you've read those great books in the Old Testament, you'll know that these prophets performed all sorts of bizarre acts in public in an attempt to visibly you know, highlight the nation's sins and to call Israel to repentance. All of that stuff is good. But what matters, it seems, on the Day of Judgment is this, personal acts of loving service. And the wonderful thing about all of this is how strikingly easy it is. Again, notice that Jesus does not say, I was hungry and you put an end to the famine. I was thirsty and you dug a well for my entire village. I was sick and you performed the operation that saved my life. I was a prisoner and you, you, you set me free. If it's in your power to do that kind of thing, like if you have expertise, for example, in agriculture and engineering and cardiac surgery and law, wonderful. Use those gifts for good. To whom much is given, much will be required. But I think most of you are kind of like me. You're ordinary people. And in his graciousness and goodness and mercy, the king sets the bar low enough for people like me to meet. I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I can do that. I can buy somebody a sandwich. I can get somebody you know, a gift card for groceries. I can hand out bread and fruit at our drop-in program at the Stone Cafe. I don't need to be uh, you know, a professional chef to do that. I was naked, and you clothed me. I can do that, too. I've got a couple of extra winter coats at home and a few scarves that are just kind of sitting around untouched in my closet. It's easy for me to come to church on Monday and just, you know, put it here in the pile with the rest of the drop-in stuff to be given away. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. Who are the strangers in our community? In St. John. Well, um, perhaps immigrants and refugees, newcomers who've arrived to this little port city from all sorts of countries around the world, you could welcome them very easily, you know, invite them to church, and invite them to your house for a barbecue, let your kids play with their kids, learn a couple of words in their language, right? Give them, if they need it, an opportunity to practice English, an opportunity to practice French. And you don't need specialized skills to do this. You don't need to, to have a degree in international relations to do this very basic thing. 
I was sick and you visited me. Again, easy, right? Who do you know in this community that's too ill to leave their home on a regular basis, the shut-in? Well, visit them. Who do you know that's receiving treatment in the hospital and is in a dark place and lonely and frightened? Again, visit them. You know, you don't have to have a medical degree, d degree just to go and visit the sick. You don't have to have a degree in theology to pray with the sick. Any Christian can do this. You can do this. This is within pretty much everybody's reach. And to some, like, all of this stuff kind of sounds pathetic. And, and I have to admit, even as I was writing this sermon and I was listing this, you know, all this stuff off, I thought, man, that's, that's really pathetic. Right? So you gave a homeless guy a coat. So what? Right? He still might have to sleep in, like, minus 15, minus 20 degree weather tonight. And he might not have a tent. What good did you do? So you, you, you bought somebody a sandwich, so what? In a few hours, he'll just be hungry again. Plus, there are all the, the hundreds of other people that you didn't buy a sandwich for, and you weren't able to feed. What about them? So you had the Somalian family over for Thanksgiving, and the food was really unfamiliar to them, and there was this language barrier and cultural barrier, and it was awkward. And even then, you didn't come close to scratching the surface of the refugee crisis. So why did, you, why did you bother doing it? Here's my response to, 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 to all of this. First of all, I think a bit of humility is in fact in order. Buying a homeless guy a sandwich doesn't qualify you to receive the Order of Canada. Donating a, donating a used coat to the church doesn't mean that you should be on the short list to receive a Nobel Peace Prize. Peace Prize. These acts are simple and humble and we should be able to do them almost unconsciously without our left hand knowing what our right hand is doing. In fact, I think it's telling that, that one of the characteristics of the righteous sheep in today's parable is their ignorance of their own good deeds, right? When they're commended by the king, they're actually surprised. They don't remember ever having served the king. It says something about their heart, about their humility. The second point I want to make is this. Sure, buying a coat for one homeless person is a small thing. But if, what if we're not just talking about one disciple of Jesus buying a coat for a needy person, but a whole community of Christians providing winter clothing to dozens of people? What if you don't just have one Christian offering a meal to the hungry, but a whole congregation offering weekly meals to hundreds of people? And what if you don't just have one person inviting a refugee family over for Thanksgiving dinner, but a whole team of people surrounding that same refugee family, inviting them over for supper regularly, going to their house for supper, helping them access health care services, helping the parents find employment, helping the kids get extra academic help? And what if we're not just talking about individual Christian congregations like Stone, doing that sort of thing, but whole networks of congregations working within and beyond denominational lines, pooling their resources, coordinating their efforts, all in an attempt to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, welcome the stranger, care for the sick, and visit the imprisoned. What if millions of Christians across the country make good works their way of life? What if billions of Christians around the world minister to the least of these, Jesus' brothers and sisters, Jesus' family? Again, one lone drop-in volunteer handing a banana over the counter to a homeless guy frankly doesn't look that impressive. But I want you to zoom out. Imagine billions of Christians performing similar acts of humble service all around the world over the course of, of many centuries. That, in the eyes of Satan, is a terrifying sight to behold. Rank upon rank of saints the church militant here on earth, the church triumphant in heaven, flanked by all the angelic hosts and the king himself, the commander of that mighty force, leading the charge. Such a sight is enough to send all the armies of hell fleeing in panic. Performed by enough disciples, humble acts of service towards the least of these, honestly, I believe, have a revolutionary impact, because by such good works, Societies are transformed, 
cultures are reformed, a little bit of leaven does in fact raise a whole batch of dough, to quote the old biblical proverb. Not only that, but the good deeds of the saints serve as a bold public proclamation, a proclamation that's every bit as impactful and meaningful as marching on Parliament Hill, for example, or, or gathering around City Hall with placards. By such good works, the church proclaims to the world a better way, a better way of living together. By such good works, the church shows the rest of the world what the coming kingdom of God will look like, and we invite others to be a part of that kingdom. How does one enter into this eternal kingdom of righteousness and peace? Simply by living by the ethic of that kingdom here and now in this fallen world. How do we live by that kingdom ethic? Well, here's one way, by personally serving our king, ministering to our king, as he comes to us in the form of the least of these, his brothers and sisters, by giving food to the hungry, drink to the thirsty, clothing to the cold and naked, welcome to the stranger, companionship to the sick and to the imprisoned. In short, by providing for the basic needs of the most desperate and needy people around us. Do this in the name of Christ, and as Jesus himself says, we will find ourselves vindicated on the day of judgment. For it is then that the king will look upon you and declare, Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world.